Hey, hockey fans, welcome to Across the Pond, Hong Kong's first and only hockey podcast. I'm your host, Chris Ivany, and tonight's episode is brought to you by the China Hockey Group. Tonight's program is brought to you by the China Hockey Group. The CHG is a family focused group of ice hockey leagues, training programs, and community initiatives. They focus on the growth of hockey in Hong Kong and southern China, as well as the development of student athletes, where sporting goals are achieved alongside educational pursuits. The CHG is comprised of a number of hockey programs. Established in 2011, the CIHL is Hong Kong's elite adult hockey league. The Junior Tigers program is Hong Kong's premier youth hockey organization, featuring the Scotia Bank Island League and Learn to Play and Learn to Skate programs. The SCIHL is an adult league for those seeking a more recreational experience. In addition, the CHG showroom is the exclusive reseller of Bauer Warrior hockey equipment and offers services including skate sharpening and fittings. For more information and links to their social media sites, go visit ChinaHockeyGroup.com. That's ChinaHockeyGroup.com. All right, folks, your CIHL update this week is going to be a short one because there are no games being played currently in the CIHL due to the Hong Kong government restrictions due to the fourth wave of coronavirus hitting the city. So just a quick update on the stats in the league. Um, Ryan Chu is leading the league with seven goals right now. Nicholas Weiberg, new, new member of the league, is leading the league with 10 assists, and he also has 15 points. In the standings, the Macau Aces are leading the way with a 4-0 record. The, Macau, or the Kowloon Warriors are in second place with a 3-2 record. The Hong Kong Tycoons are 2-3. And, and the South China Sharks are currently 0-4. All right, folks, my guest today is from Titletown, Boston, Massachusetts. Over a span of 20 years, he played over 1,500 NHL games, playoffs included, scored almost 1,500 total points, and nearly 1,600 career penalty minutes. He's fourth all-time in points as an American-born player, sits in the American Hockey Hall of Fame. He's a nine-time NHL All-Star, two-time Olympian, author, husband, and father. Please welcome to Across the Pond Hockey Talks, Mr. Jeremy Roenick. How are you, JR? I'm doing great, my friend. Appreciate uh, appreciate being on your show and especially being o- on over in Hong Kong, Asia. I think that's really cool. This I have to say is my first first Asian podcast. Oh, uh, I'm very where, excited where, about that. Where it, it, at least where it was originated. So it's uh, it's good to be with you. Thanks, man. And uh, I guess we should thank uh, your friend Kosuke right off the top for setting this one up. And uh, what can you tell me about uh, about your friend who's uh, who's actually only a new acquaintance to me? Yeah, well, Kosuke is, um, is a very good friend of mine. Um, actually met him at one of my speaking engagements in New York City, and we hit it off right from the start. Mm-hmm. Both his, both his boys are big hockey fans yeah. and hockey players, and I uh, was you know, I was just—I've been very uh, lucky enough to bring them to an outdoor game and uh, become very, very good friends with the family. And he's—he's uh, he's just a—he's he's a great entrepreneur. Him and his wife. Um, his wife's actually smarter than he is, and he'll agree to that. But, <laughs> uh, um, but uh, they're great people, and uh, you know, we miss them. Miss them back here in the states. That's great. And uh, yeah, Kosuke uh, it plays in the hockey league here that uh, I'm refing in and uh, I coached his son a little bit. Yeah, great family, great hockey kids and just part of uh, what's going on here in, in Hong Kong as far as the development of hockey. Um, so Jeremy, I'd like to take you all the way back to your younger days growing up in Boston. Um, when did hockey exactly become a big part of your life? Um, well, I, I was obviously very young, um, at the time was living in Connecticut and, um, you know, uh, my family, we lived in an apartment complex and this little, uh, the next door neighbor was one of my, as you call the play dates, right? This little mm-hmm. boy that I used to play with. And, um, you know, it was right, uh, right before my little brother was born, I was about three years old and, uh, three and a half. And, um, my, uh, next door neighbor uh came over and spoke to my mom and said hey 
you know, little Johnny's going to play hockey, go to uh, have, you know, skating lessons and hockey lessons would, would Jeremy come with him? And because if he goes by himself, he's probably not going to like it. He's probably want to get off the ice. Yeah. If he has a buddy, to, if he has a buddy to do it with, you know, he'll probably, he'll, he'll probably jump on board and like it more. So, you know, we did, and, uh, I went and tried it, you know, the double runners and, you know, yeah. the you know, standing on the chair, football helmet, all that mm-hmm. stuff, and mm-hmm. definitely not prepared for it. But, um, you know, I gravitated to it right away. Loved it right off the start. Um, it was hard to get me off the ice, you know, from my first time never, ever being out there from three and a half on. So, you know, that being said, um, I don't know <laughs> whatever happened to um, my little play date friend that uh, <laughs> if he did anything in hockey. But, uh, you know, they are pr- pretty much responsible for me starting the game, whereas my, my dad was more of a soccer and football player. So right. hockey was not in, not in our in our um, uh, interest level at the time. Uh, what is it something that you just loved right away? You gravitated to it right, right away. away. Right yeah. away. Yeah. My parents had had a hard time getting me off the ice when I was little. I wanted right. to stay on all the time. Um, you know, as 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 I got older, it got to be, you know, playing on the on the ponds, right, right. in Boston. Mm-hmm. And there was a pond down the down the street from me that, you know, in the, in the winter just froze up solid and it would be hours and hours. Um, you know, I'd come back from school and I'd, you know, my brother and I would go down to the ponds and have pickup games and at the time with no cell phones you know we had to listen for the cowbell to to let us know when it was time to you know take the skates off with our frostbitten wow. toes and make our way you know hike back to house and stuff like that so love hearing um, those stories yeah so you know those those are the days and you know yeah. those those are the days that you think about and you know what make you love the game of hockey and bring of you back course. to the you know the core of it and i was it was a big part of my childhood for sure Right. So from 86 to 88, you went to, is it Thayer or Thayer? How do you say that? Thayer Academy. Thayer Academy. So you went to Thayer Academy. You won two state championships there. Um, You represented the U.S. on the 88 national junior team. At what point in that little sequence of years did you start thinking, maybe I could do this for a living? Um, Well, it was actually right. It was actually before, um, before I started high school. Uh, I started getting lots of attention um, as a as a pee wee. Mm-hmm. Uh, scored like three hundred goals at one year. Uh, you know, or three hundred points, two hundred two hundred goals right. one season. Um, you know, we won uh, as a Bantam, won two national championships back to back with New Jersey Rockets, mm-hmm. and you know, getting lots of attention in terms of college coaches and and knowing that there were some NHL coaches around the, uh, around the rinks at certain times. So how so, did you choose Thayer? Uh, it's, it's Thayer. Oh, sorry, Thayer, sorry. Yeah. yeah, Thayer. Um, it's kind of a funny story. Um, I was living in Virginia at the time and it was, I've had, I had a couple of major junior teams mm-hmm. that were interested in getting me, um, on their teams. Wayne Gretzky's team being one of them, mm-hmm. uh, and Hall, um, the Portland winter Hawks were another, um, and uh, Verdun up in Quebec League. There's about three or four teams that were very interested in me becoming um, part of their junior team. So that would mean giving up school and having to, you know, give up college and everything like that. But um, so my parents, not wanting me to leave school and give up my education, decided to. Uh, uh, my dad took a uh, a a salary a salary decrease and mm-hmm. and a and a job demotion to move up to Boston to, uh, to put me in a better hockey area, which is, you know, New England is probably yeah. at the time was one of the best hockey areas going as well as there was uh, an up and coming school. And it's a, one that was a day school. So I didn't have to leave. I could stay right uh, at home still. And, you know, so it, uh, there was that just that good choice. It was a good school. And, gotcha. um, and, but we, you know, myself and Tony Monty, who was my yeah, I was going to ask you about your your line mate there at there. Yeah, my line mate. Yeah, so he 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 broke his femur in a major uh, yes uh, in a major accident at, on the ice, uh, and actually had to miss so much school that he repeated his freshman year, whereas I had missed I had repeated uh, a year earlier in my earlier in my. Um, uh, middle school day, uh, my uh, elementary days because yeah. of lack of lack of of schooling because of right. hockey. Yep. So we ended it up happens. being freshmen at the same time. Uh, we had a great team, won two New England championships. But um, you know, it was before 
before high school that uh, I really thought that you know there was a there was a chance of of great things happening. Um, yeah. And you know that that caused us to move up to a more hockey hockey oriented uh, area, which obviously put me right in the spotlight and right in front of all the college scouts and pro scouts. And yeah. it was uh, turned out to be a good move. And as you mentioned, in your teens, you were always ranked at the top of the U.S. charts with with the great Mike mm-hmm. Madonna, of course. Uh, at yep. that time, what sort of player would you say you were? I was just a speed talented player. I yeah. had no physical I had no physical traits whatsoever. I was right. always the smallest I was always the smallest player on my team yeah. by a long shot. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't uh shoot out even even my first year pro, I was I was drafted at, at 150 pounds. Right. So I never I never was a big strong solid guy. So for me it was always speed, uh, you know, incredibly gifted hands and uh, you know, hockey IQ that was, you know, that uh, kind of brought it all together. Yeah. Um, uh, that was the type of player. I was not the type of player that was that liked to play through injury. You know, I had to learn all that once I got to right. the game. Of course. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I could pretty much as a kid do whatever I wanted to do on the ice. I was mm-hmm. um, very. Uh, it, it was tough to stop. I was, you know, not too many defensemen could stop me. So it was right. like it was. It was pretty easy for me. So yeah. Um, didn't have to be that tough um you know physical player that i had to be in, in the nhl but uh, i was taught that very very early in my career but um you know it's it was a it was a an easy road it seemed like an easy road for me to the right. national hockey league but it was a it was a tough start well before you got there uh coast wanted me to mention this actually he said that you spent a few minutes as a student at boston college can you tell me a little bit about that day <laughs> yeah, so it was kind. Of, it was kind of weird at how this all transpired. Um, so it was I went through a bunch of different things happening. I actually first got asked to um, to try out for the U.S. Olympic team for the, the 1988 Olympic team in 1987. So I actually went to the Olympic trials and had a very very good Olympic trial, um, mm-hmm. but they did not pick me because I was. I, they were afraid I was too young that I was going to miss too much school and high school, and so um, you know, even being one of the top players at the Olympic trial at, at uh, 16 years old, 16 and a half years old, um, 17 years old, they, they 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 were just too afraid to take a a, a young kid. Right. So so I missed that. Then I got drafted uh, after my junior year, and this is the, where the crazy thing happened. Chicago, I got drafted eighth overall, um, but at the time, you know, salaries weren't very prominent or, you know, hefty. They were offering me $95,000 and, right. you know, as a first round draft pick, you know, other guys were signing higher than that. So mm-hmm. we, we held out and um, knowing that I, you know, going back to high school was not going to be an option for me or increase my talents. Uh, we made a deal with the headmaster of Thayer to, if I took four classes at Boston College, I can get my full year's credits and graduate in September when I, you know, probably should be going away to camp. Right. Hopefully, hopefully I have a contract. Mm-hmm. Well, that contract that didn't come. So I had to figure out what I was going to do for, for hockey so, uh, and schooling. So I figured I went to BC in the summer. We'll go to BC for, you know, for the start of September and come do my college and be a BC Eagle. Well, yeah. we got, I got there and you know did the whole party weekend and that was all great and getting ready to go to my first class on monday and still i'm probably about a week late to camp so nhl camp has already started a week before so I'd already, i was already a holdout mm-hmm. as a first round draft pick um i get a call into the uh, athletic director's office and the athletic director right before my first class proceeded to tell me that they weren't expecting me to come out of college this early and that they had given away all of the, um, all of the scholarships for that year. Oh no! And, and asked me if I would consider being a walk-on. Yeah. For, uh, for the BC Eagle hockey team oh, and wow. take take a scholarship to kick field goals for the for the football team. No way. Now <laughs> I was a pretty good kicker in high school because my That's soccer hilarious. days. Uh, because you know my soccer talents were yeah. better, as good if not better than my hockey talents. So soccer came, yeah. and f- football kicking came in, you know, came easy to me. Mm-hmm. So uh, 
you know, I just kind of went to my first class kind of feeling like, Ooh, that I'd be the most talent, you know, most touted, um, you know, walk on, in, you know, probably collegiate history. Yeah. Um, and I went to my first class and within five minutes of the first class, I found out what a syllabus was. <laughs> and the thing was, the thing was a novel. It looked like a novel. The thing was so big. And oh my God. I'm like, I'm like, this is not for me. <laughs> And uh, I literally walked. I walked out of the class five minutes into my first class. I left my books right in, you know, right at my at my at my uh, my desk. And yeah. Call, called my agent and asked him if he'd made any headway with the contract of mine. Um, and then my agent said, "Nope, they're still offering ninety five thousand. And I said, "Well, not, let's take it. Let's go to camp." And they're like, "Well, we've been saying no to this for the last." Three months. Now you want to take it? I'm like, well, I didn't know what a syllabus was three months ago. I do now. Let's go play hockey. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I made you know, 24 hours later. I, I played in my first NHL scrimmage and scored two goals. Wow, that's you know? incredible. So when yeah. did the call from Gretzky come to go to Hall? That was when I was 14. That was when I was a freshman, a freshman in uh, in high school. Yeah. Uh, did you did you have any idea what you were getting into when you went up to Quebec? And because you absolutely tore up the queue well, in weird. such a short yeah, period of time. Yeah, it was weird. It was weird how I got there. I said no to Gretz. Um, yeah. At the time in 1994-95, I said no to him, which probably not too many people say no to Gretz to That's go play right. for his team. Yeah. But I said no to him then. But but the team that year that that summer still drafted me. They took me in their last pick of the of the uh, of the Quebec Major Junior League draft. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, just not knowing what was going to happen. Yeah. yeah, just taking a shot. Just have me on the roster. So what happened when I went to Chicago, and I had a great camp, but I did not start the season well. I actually played four games with the Hawks in 1988, yep. and had no points. So Mike Keenan decided to send me someplace where I can play against better competition, learn to live on the road, travel, mm-hmm. play play tougher competition. So since um, Hull drafted me in the Quebec League and Sault Ste. Marie drafted me in the Ontario League, they gave me a choice of which one I wanted to go to. Okay. So it was pretty it was pretty obvious to me to go to an offensive minded league, mm-hmm. uh, a league that was closer to um, you know to Boston. So the Quebec league was an easy pick for me. Um, and I did, I, I stepped in and tore that, tore that league up. I think I only played like 24, 25, 26 games and still made. You had the, 70 points. Yeah. 70, <laughs> 72 points in 26, 25 games. Yeah, absolutely. Who incredible. Knows, who knows what I would have done if I would have been there a whole year. Well, that's what I mean. I mean, so many people, you took a jump almost from high school uh, right into the queue, and you had seventy points in twenty eight games. Like, how were you able to make that look so easy? Was it just you your know, speed? Again, like, again, you know, again, you know, this it was just you know, it seemed it seemed easy for me. At I don't, that time, I, you know. Yeah. Obviously, I had some good. I had some good teammates on that team. Stefan Matteau was on that team. Yeah. Martin Jelena, mm-hmm. Martin Jelena, who had a great NHL career, was uh, was my winger. Um, you know, and, and I made the first team All Star for the year in yeah. only twenty six games. So yeah. it was. Um, it was it was a really good league for me to get my confidence up and, yeah. and be that uh you know, be that that um I think that you know, that confident player that I that I needed to be. Of course. And yeah, that definitely would have been probably yeah, looking back, maybe a smart move to send you down there and let you just tear it up for a little while. Um exactly. so then you were drafted eighth overall, so to head back there, um you're you drafted by the by the uh, by the Blackhawks, like you said, uh with the likes of Steve Larmer, Denny Savard, who was one of my all time faves. Dirk Graham, Doug Wilson, and most importantly, perhaps for you, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Mike Keenan behind the bench. Can you tell mm-hmm. me a little bit about the Keenan effect and how did he kind of transform your mentality and, and your style of play? Well, at the time, you know, he was called Iron Mike, and he's called Iron Mike for a reason. Um, he wanted he wanted his teams to be as mean and physical, tough and hard to play against every night. Uh, and that meant, um, you know, physically hitting in your face, um, a, 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 just a grueling mentality. And, you know, cause he was, he was a, in the Philadelphia system, which, you know, the broad street bullies mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And so he kind of, that, that was his mentality. Um, when I got there, like I told you, I was 156, 157 pounds at the time. Yeah. Um, he threw on these big Donzi pads on me. You know, I remember 
you know, my one of my first preseason games against an actual team was in Kalamazoo against the Minnesota North Stars. And I wouldn't hit anybody. I just kept swinging by all my checks and swinging by all my checks. And by the second period, by the second period, Mike Keenan ran down the bench after I passed by another check. And he gra- literally grabbed me by the neck and um, choked me to the, you know, to the point where he was spitting in my face, yelling at me that if I yeah. ever swung by another check, I would never play a game for him as long as he was coach. And I, and I knew that, that now my, you know, my dreams of being an NHL player were, were hinged on whether I was going to play physical and finish my checks and kind of mm-hmm. be that all around player. So yeah. I kind of, I kind of used my speed because I didn't have the size. I turned myself into that human torpedo and launched yeah. myself into, you know, into oblivion to try to hit people. And yeah. you know, it, it, there was a lot of ice bags. There was a lot of bruised, bruised, uh, um, you know, bruised muscles and bruised bones. But I found that people really enjoyed watching me hit and play physical and also score goals and, um, you know, trying to play through adversity, tra- trying to play through pain. Um, you know, and it came to be where my, my first playoff series against St. Louis, um, is a game where, uh, the, in the first period I got a skate, uh, up through the nose. It cut me for like 16 stitches up over my nose. And then I got cross checked in the mouth by Glenn Featherstone and lost three, three of my front teeth that shattered all over my tongue. Um, ended up getting a penalty and coming out and scoring, actually scoring the game winning goal of that series in that game. And I, I, and I remember the picture that I took after the game was me all sweaty with blood all over my nose, a 16 stitch cut on my nose, smiling with no teeth in front because I just lost them. And knowing that I look like that, but that I had played, played through it, scored the winning goal, you know, showed everybody that I was tough. And it was kind of like a defining moment for, for me as a, as a player who can play through pain and play through the, play through the, you know, the hardships of, of, you know, being a professional athlete. Um, Yeah, totally. And I mean, a lot of the times do you you agree that uh, it's a mental game that you have to be able to willing to put yourself out there and realize that these bumps and bruises are going to go away and you can handle it and, you know, try and form that identity. Yeah. Well, you got to listen to it. I I always, I always talk about, listen, you know, back then, you know, the salaries weren't high. Yeah. Players, players were interchangeable. I was a young kid. I and I was afraid because you know if you're not playing in the show, you're you're playing in the minors for twenty grand, twenty five thousand right. bucks, mm-hmm. right? So, and if you don't make it there, you're you're coming out and you're finding another job. And for me, I didn't have any other aspirations or any other job, you know, skills right. to do anything else but play hockey. So for me, I was like, holy smoke, uh, you know, here I can. You know, you have to play through things. If you miss games because you're injured or because there's pain or something like that, and someone comes in to take your job and does a better job at it, you're shit out of luck. You're gone. You know, you're going to have to fight even harder to try to get that spot back. So for me, I was, um, that was, that, that was my motivating factors is to be able to fight through pain, play through injury, yeah. um, and, and be effective. Let it be my, be my, my driving force and my motivation rather than, you know, being a pussy and, and bailing out and being afraid to, you know, to play through it. And you know what? I got a lot of, I got a lot of praise from my coach. Of I got course. a lot of respect from my coach. Yeah. I got a lot of respect from my teammates. Yeah. I actually got a lot of respect from my, from my opponents. So, you know, there's something to be said about having that inner drive and that, that commitment and that, that kind of that resolute mentality. And, yeah. you know, I, I had to do it early because it was, it was so cutthroat back in the late eighties, early nineties. I mean, you're, if you're not sticking up for yourself, you're getting beat up every night. If you're not, you know, if you're not, you know, laying it on the line, your teammates are, are giving it to you. You know, it's, yeah. if you're not playing through the pain, your coach is, is not respecting you. So it's just a lot of, it was a, it was a good, it was actually a good era for me to, to grow up in. It certainly seems like, uh, or it has been a reoccurring theme with most of my guests, uh, the people who've managed to play professional hockey is, being able to be effective every single night, even though you're hurt and you're banged up. So yeah, that just, uh, you know, reiterates a lot of the things that, you know, we've heard over the past uh, number of interviews and people that I've talked to and guys who spent careers in the minor leagues and, uh, 
you know, that, that difference, that's what it comes down to. Are you willing to do that? Can you be a good pro night in and night out? So mm-hmm. certainly you, uh, you grasp that, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, you had eight incredible seasons in Chicago, a pair of 50 goal seasons, three times over a hundred points. When do you feel like w- during that run, when did you, when did you feel most like you identified yourself as an NHL player and Jeremy Roenick was here to stay? Probably that 91, 92 season, mm-hmm. um, the year we went to the finals. Uh, you know, we lost we lost out in 91, being the number one team in the league. We won the President's Cup trophy. We lost in the first round in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Um, I came back that next year, scored 50 goals, and um, we ended up, you know, setting a record for the most – wins uh consecutive wins in the playoffs went to the stanley cup final you know i'm playing on the number one line with michelle goulet and steve larmer um you know being in my my probably my second my second all-star game at that point um you know i was at one point for most of the season top you know top of um top of the league in scoring um you know that those that was probably the year that i you know where i knew that i was one of the one of the premier players of the game and was being treated that way. And mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know, but that brings a whole new level of pressure for you and le- level pressure for me, you know, like you just mentioned a couple seconds earlier, being able to perform and, and to produce every single night. That's what it became down to. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, and I was doing that and yeah. it was confident and it was, I was going into games you know, wondering, you know, how many points I was going to get, not whether I was going to get one. It was right. how many. That's a great and, feeling. Yeah, uh, it was. It, it's. It, it is. It is a, a good way to be, especially when you're at the in the best league in the world. Of course, and you I mean you're you're playing with a couple of of real veteran players. There was that. Do you do you attribute to some of your success to to those guys? Oh my god, everything. Yeah, everything. I mean, for me to to be able to go to Chicago and for the first year at least. Um, you know, watch Dennis Savard play. Um, yeah. And then after they got rid of Savvy, they brought in uh, Chris Chelios, who I think is epitomizes. He's, he is the absolute um, poster boy of, of, of pure athlete and yeah. competitor and um, dedication to a game, leadership, everything you could possibly say in, in, a, in an athlete. So I got to be, you know, best friends with him and watch yeah. him perform. But I also got to play with Steve Larmer, who should be a Hall of Famer. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I agree. And, uh, and and how tough he was. I mean, he sh- he should have gotten the uh, the Iron Man streak if it wasn't for the Blackhawks messing that up with the uh, contract talks. Yeah. Um, Michelle Goulet, who w- is a Hall of Famer, mm-hmm. you know, um, to be able to watch to to play with them and be able to watch them play and to and to know how to play my game with great players like that was was incredible. I mean, Doug yeah. Wilson was my first roommate. I mean, yeah, you know, Hall of Fame, how, yeah. you know, you know, I had these guys that not only, not only taught me the game on the ice, but taught me the game off the ice. And of course, taught me how to play, taught me how to play poker <laughs> and you know, very not important. very well, not, not very well in the beginning, but you know, it, yeah. it was, you know, they just, they just taught me how to be a professional. It was, um, I had a really good crew that uh, I was associated with. So after those eight years in Chicago, you kind of became that guy in Phoenix where you went for the next five years and you really helped put the Coyotes on the map as far as a hockey town. And as you went from, from Chicago to Phoenix, which is uh, pretty much a 180 as far as hockey towns goes at, in 1996. Um, so interesting stat there. You're the only player in league history to lead, lead your team in goals, assists, points, and penalty minutes in back-to-back seasons. So you were basically doing it all in Phoenix. What was that yeah. like for you, fulfilling yeah. that leadership role? And like, uh, yeah, so you touch back you, you, some of the guys that you played with uh, in Chicago, and, and now you've become that person. And what was that like for you? Yeah, that was pretty cool. I don't think anybody will, will, will break that record. By the I don't way. think I so either. That's incredible. That's a little bit of an untouchable record. Yeah. I think that's pretty, pretty cool. Not many people know that uh, that stat or that um, – that monarchy, if, if, if I can say that. Oh, you um, definitely can. Um, but, you know, going to, going to Arizona was, was actually a lot of fun for me. Um, yeah. You know, because, you know, you, you know, it's a different hockey town, but it was very much uh, very similar in terms of its energy inside the building. Um, we, we sold out every single game. There was a lot of excitement. We had a really good team, made the playoffs every year. I was playing with guys like Keith Kachuk, Craig Janney. Rick Tockett, you know, yeah. um, a lot of Teppo Newman and, you know, I, I, I can go on and on with how many great 
players I played with mm-hmm. in Phoenix. But, you know, away from the game, you could have a life. You know, it was a great place. We played a lot of golf. Yeah. Um, you know, people didn't bother you in the public. You know, you're very uh, unassuming. And, you know, that was a that was a big change for me coming from Chicago where, you know, everywhere you went, you were, you know, you were harassed, but not harassed, but, yeah. you know, people asking, wanted to talk to you, wanted to ask yeah. you questions, autographs, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So it actually, that you know, Arizona became a very, you know, good place to raise a family and, um, and live and, you know, all that stuff. And we still have a home in Arizona. So, you know, and I mean, that's 20. 24 years later, yeah. which is, you know, which has been pretty, pretty special. But, uh, you know, I, I love the fact that we taught and we introduced hockey to the desert. Very and special. They have, yeah. You know, they have a very good, they still have a very good following, even mm-hmm. though you don't see it, you know, in the building that they're in right now. But, um, there are major, major hockey fans, whether they're snowbirds or whether they're, you know, lifelong Arizona residents. It's, um, you know, and, and to tell you the truth, the hockey, the youth hockey in that town is probably what we're most proud of because we built ice dens in different parts of the city so that other kids can start the game and, you know, that were interested in coming to the games. And, you know, the soccer moms became hockey moms. And, you know, we've had people like, you know, like Matthews, Austin Matthews now, you know, who wasn't born in, in, in Arizona, but moved there at a young age and yeah. grew up playing there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I actually had, he played it, uh, you know, with my son and, you know, I, I coached, helped train both of them and on, on the ice at times. And, you know, it's, it was, it was nice that, you know, we made a big difference in the youth hockey in yeah, Arizona. You, with, you which definitely did. Special. That's really mm-hmm. special. Yeah. So part of that leadership role, uh, in Phoenix was your approach to the physical part of the game, um, which you never shied away from, from since your early days in Chicago. Um, in 98, you took out your boy Madonna and, and then you paid the price the following game. Um, <clears throat> you had a, a thumb, a thumb crushing slash from Craig, Craig Ludwig. Then Darian, yeah. ha- Darian Hatcher tried to put your head in the third row. How did you overcome yeah. that? Like not both, not just physically, but mentally to, to overcome that and come back and play like 15 days later. You played well, in game I, seven. I, I knew, I knew it was coming. I mean, I, I knew, yeah. I knew, I knew, I knew that I knew they were coming after me. I mean, listen, every time I played Mike Medano, um, I tried to, I tried to physically outbeat, out, out muscle him and try to beat him. Yeah. Cause he was always, he was always my stepping stone. He was always the guy I rated myself behind because we were always competing against each other as the best player in, in, uh, in the U S at that time. So for me, if I beat Mike, then, you know, I was the better player. I always, I had more points than Mike Madano for like 13 years, 14 years, first yeah. 14 years of my career. Um, until, you know, probably the mid 2000s when, you know, 2005, 2006, where he caught up to me. Yeah. Um, but you know, that being said, Mike was the guy that, um, that I targeted and I hit him and he was the star player. I knew the next game I was going to get it. Yeah. And you're right. You know, Craig Ludwig slashed me, broke my thumb in one place. And then, uh, you know, a second later Hatcher broke, bro- breaks my jaw in four places. Yeah. And, you know, I wasn't mad at either of them, you know, you, Hey, listen, if you're going to, you're going to play the game and you're going to get, you're going to get retribution. I had no problem with that. You know, I took liberties on their player. They're going to yeah. take liberties on me. That's fine. But I, I didn't go off the ice, even though I had a broken jaw in four places. Yeah. Uh, we had a five on three penalty, uh, power play because of it. And, uh, I stayed on the ice for the pretty much the whole five minutes with, with a broken jaw in four places. Cause I wanted to score so bad. Yeah. Just, just so I could skate off the ice on the way to the emergency room and give the give the middle finger to all the fans. <laughs> and the that team. would have been quite a moment. Yeah, it, it's the moment that I really wish I would have had. Yeah, um, and because it, it kind of epitomized the way I thought about things and the mm-hmm. way I wanted to, you know, wanted to do what I do and and get get the winning, you know, be the you know get the better hand, better end of whatever yeah. I was going to get. But seeing, like, I remember vividly watching that replay and seeing you, like, moving your teeth around and your jaw was kind of moving in your yeah, mouth a little bit. Ugly. And then it's, ugly. It, it's like the, the Rick Tockett moment, too, when his jaw got all busted up in Pittsburgh mm-hmm. and he threw on a yep. cage and came back and played. Like, those were some of the ones where you're just like, oh, man, like, that's yeah. that's and some then, warrior then, like, mentality right there. Well, you have to. And, yeah. you know, if you want to win a championship, you have to you have to pay pay the price. And course you know and then i played you know 16 days later with a big face mask over to set game seven of round one yeah and 
I, I, I never even thought about my jaw the whole time. I mean, I could care wow. less about my jaw. I, I knew if I, can, if I can play, if I can breathe, I'm playing. And that um, was one I, hell of an ugly lid that they had you wearing. Awful. It was an awful game. I think we lost one nothing that game. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it was just, it was one of those games where it really it, it frustrated me, but I played the same way that I would have played if I, if I was not hurt. And, yeah. you know, it, it, you know, sometimes I, I always said, if I woke up the next day, I'm going to be okay. Now, if it, you know, if I woke up with pain, I'll deal with that. If I woke right. up with a, a broken jaw, a broken bone, I'll deal with that. But, right. um, you, you do what you have to do to try to win championships, try to win, try to win rounds. And, yeah. you know, I don't think I could have lived with myself if I, if I could have played not to attempt it. And I think, I think you, I think that's missing a lot in, in today's game, a lot because the league doesn't let you. That's true. But yeah. I think, I think there are a lot of players that won't do it because they're too comfortable. Yeah. They're comfortable in, in how much money they make. They're too comfortable in, in their, in their position and mm-hmm. whether win, winning is that is actually as important. Right to some of them nowadays as it, as it was before. And the second time you uh, you broke your jaw, you uh, you actually left the ice to a standing ovation in Madison Square Gardens. I'm sure that's not exactly the way first, you wanted to get I think a standing I'm the first. Ovation. I think I'm the first flyer. <laughs> For, oh, a definitely. Stand, standing ovation. Leaving. No doubt. No doubt. Now I'm sure. So I'm sure a lot of them stood and in, in you know happiness that I was leaving the game. Yeah. Uh, 15. <laughs> but um, yeah. I think people saw the replay of that of how that puck hit me and how fast it hit me. Yeah. And the fact that I was knocked out cold and blood was pouring out of my face on, you know, onto the ice. And, you know, the fact that I, I got up and, and, you know, with the trainer holding my jaw and gave a thumbs up, I think, I think, you know, New Yorkers are New Yorkers. They're passionate. They're, they're, they're sports crazy. And they, they know toughness and they know um, grit and uh, appreciate, they appreciate it. And for them to give me a standing O was, was probably one of the coolest one of the coolest moments I've had in my career for sure. No doubt. All right, just a quick word from uh, one of our sponsors. Are your headphones falling apart, or does your cable do that annoying thing where it only plays sound from one ear? Then maybe it's time for an upgrade. Accessory House Global is your one-stop shop for premium headphone accessories. They specialize in ear pads, headbands, carrying cases, and audio cables. Whether you have Bose, Sony, Sennheiser, Beats, Fostex, Denon, or even a set of high-end focal headphones, they've got you covered. All across the pond, hockey podcast listeners get 20% off their first purchase. Use the code ahg 20 OFF at the checkout and boom, you're sorted. You can check them out on YouTube or at the real AHG on Instagram. Check out their website at accessoryhouseglobal.com and take your first step to reviving your audio experience. All right, so Jeremy, 1998. And again, in 2002, you got to wear the red, white, and blue and represent the U.S. at the Olympics. Was that your? Tell us about your first Olympic experience in Nagano. Uh, I was very, uh, very forgetful. To tell you the truth, um, we were going in pretty, pretty cocky after after winning the um, winning the '96 the '96 World Cup. Right. Um, so we go into '98 thinking that we're you know, odds on favorite. And, you know, we, we, you know, we, we stunk. We, we, you know, we were just, we were out of sync. We weren't, uh, we weren't prepared mentally. We weren't prepared physically. And, um, you know, we got run out of Nagano and, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the Canadian media, um, were definitely, uh, not, not, um, fair in their assessment of, of, of the, of the dorm rooms and, they did everything they can do to try to embarrass us. And, you know, it just, it was, it was an Olympics to forget, which okay. is why, I think, which is why I think 2002 in Salt Lake mm-hmm. was, um, you know, was such a, a an amazing, uh, you know, I think uh, probably one of the most amazing things in my career because, you know, we got to the finals against Canada, our biggest rival, you know, we were doing what we were spe- expected to do. Um, you know, it, we were on top of the world in terms of, of a hockey nation, hockey power. 
And, you know, my generation was, you know, got us there. I mean, yeah. granted, the, the biggest win outside 1980 Olympics yeah. was the 96 World Cup. But this game being the final of the Olympics was a 10 times bigger game than the World Cup. And if we could have won that, that would have been amazing. But we were still in it. But, uh, you know, the Olympics was a, it, it was a great experience to be able to play in the Olympics, play for your country, uh, playing the, the, in probably the the most watched uh, sporting event in the world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that being the Olympics and knowing that you are one of those very, very few of the top, top end of athletes in the world. Did you, you enjoy the big, big ice as well? It didn't bother me. Um, you know, I liked it. Uh, obviously, you know, I was a speed guy. That, yeah. The, the, you know, the, the big ice didn't, uh, didn't bother me too much, but it was more of a European game. It was a European game that we had to get used to that kind of was, was hard to play because it wasn't a physical game. It was more of a tactical, um, defensive, tic-tac-toe st- type of play, especially on big ice where you don't chase the puck around. You let the puck come to you and you let the players come to you and you take away space, and, and uh, you know, which to me was – it's a tough, tough, tough way to play. Um, much, much rather been on the, the regular NHL size ice. Right, of course. So uh, take me back to 2001. You finally get a taste of the free agent market. Um, how did you end up choosing Philly? Uh, well, I chose Philly because we were in Detroit. And um, at the time, I was looking at Detroit, Boston, and Philadelphia. And um, my wife was a big horse rider. And uh, at the time, we were in Detroit looking for, uh you know, at the area, seeing if it was the place that we want to be in. And my wife said, you know, what? there's no horses here. There's, there's no place for me to ride horses here. And at that time, we had just left, um, just left dinner with the Detroit GM, you know, after just talking, you know, f- finished our trip. And, um, you know, Bob, Bobby Clark called me and said, we need, uh, we need an answer from you tonight. Cause if not, we're going to get somebody else that we have somebody else on our radar. And I had to make a split decision last second to either, you know, take Philly or um, take Boston or take Detroit. And I actually chose Philly because of Rick Tockett and Mm -hmm. um, the team that they had there. Uh, Boston had just gotten rid of Billy Guerin. You know, I I didn't think that, you know, playing at home would have been tough for me, family and friend wise. And uh, I just thought, you know, if you can, if you want to win a Stanley Cup, you don't get rid of Bill Guerin's. You get you 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 go get Bill Guerin's. Right. So the direction so, of the team there. Yeah, it's just so I, I had to make a split decision. And yeah. to tell you the truth, uh, my wife's my wife's uh, riding and Rick Tockett uh, was my final final deciding point, which which kind of helped Detroit because instead of them signing me, they signed Dominic Kasich and won a cup, won a cup that, that next year. So, right. and it's debatable whether they won or won that cup without Dominic Kasich. So kind of funny. That, yeah. You know, that funny little just, story. Yeah. So it's just uh, my luck about what, missing cups, but still, yeah, you know. I wasn't going to bring that up. It's all right. It's all good. <laughs> uh, after your second broken jaw and upteenth concussion, 2004, was was that arguably the best chance you had at a Stanley Cup with that team you had in Philly, or do you think it was the ninety one? Two thousand four was the best team. Two thousand four yeah. was, was the best team I've ever been on. Okay, and it was really it was really cool because um, you know I had played I had played high school with Tony Monti. I had played I was Tony Monti and I played together for the Chicago Blackhawks. Yeah, uh, when I got traded for, for the Blackhawks to Phoenix, Phoenix ended up training Alexei Zamnoff to Chicago for me and that Philly team, actually all three of us were on one line together, me, Jamnoff and Tony, which was a really pretty cool, pretty cool scenario knowing our, our history together. Um, we had Mark Recchi, John LeClaire, Simone Gagne, Eric Desjardins. Um, I mean, I can, Justin Williams, I mean, I can go on and on about players that we had on that team that were, I mean, the only problem was, is we had so many injuries yeah. I think we, I think we had, um, and I had major concussions cause I just come back from my major concussion with my broken jaw. Yeah. Um, I got a, I got a, I got hit really bad in, um, in the second game of, of the, of the third round. Um, 
that gave me another concussion. And we were playing, actually, we had three three forwards that were playing defense at the time. We were so decimated defensively. And um, we lost in game seven, uh, which we knew whoever won that game was going was gonna to win the final. Um, because both of us would have beat Calgary that year, we were we were that that much better than any of any of the teams in the West. So, yeah, that was my best opportunity, and we we ended up losing Game Seven just because we were just so decimated with injury. Right. I didn't realize you had three forwards playing defense. I knew you had the injury troubles, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's not something you want to go through with that kind of a team. I mean, yeah, destined. I thought that team was destined for a cup. So, um, okay. yeah, after leaving Philly, you're at the end of your career, you bounced around a little bit. And at that, what you mentioned earlier, that's kind of when Mike McDonald caught up to you in points. You were dealing with a lot of injuries. You had had over 40 NHL fights, more than 800 stitches in your face. What injury was the toughest to play through during those final few years? Um, shoot, you don't. I, I will have to say probably, and I've never said this before, so it's probably the first time I've said it to anybody. Yeah. Um, and it's it was the worst injury was probably my mental state yeah. at the time. Um, my mental state at uh, was you know we were coming off uh, a lockout, coming off of um, you know losing a whole year's salary, um, you know which was which was unnecessary. Yeah, I didn't work out very much in the off season. I got got traded to Los Angeles. I was just not in a good mind frame. Um, you know, in Los Angeles, I didn't have, I didn't feel, feel good on the ice. I didn't, didn't have a trainer that knew how to sharpen my skates very well. And if you're not good on your skates, you're not good anywhere. So I had the worst year of my career and, you know, kind of set me for a tailspin. So I would say the worst injury was probably my mental attitude, my yeah. mental state that, um, that was really hard to get over until Doug Wilson came and, uh, you know, asked me to come play for the, play for the Sharks for uh, the, my last two seasons, which was, you know, two of my favorite seasons of my of my career. Wow. No, I'm really glad you mentioned that because, you know, as fans of hockey and uh, people who are watching you guys uh, as professional athletes from the outside, we often forget, like, how difficult it is to, to be a professional athlete and how you have to be turned on all the time and, like you said, performing every single night and putting your body on the line. It, it has to play a toll mentally. So, you know, I think that's uh, a really important thing for uh, to mention, and thanks for, uh, for mentioning that. Um, some some players elevate their game in big moments, and you are undoubtedly one of those players. You're actually tied with Mike Madonna for game-winning goals in your career. Did you know that? 92 game-winning goals. And uh, uh, did I didn't you know, know Mike was up there, but I knew I was up there. You're up there, yeah. So how do you explain that ability? And I mean, I believe you've scored four playoff series clinching goals, not game-winning goals, series clinching goals. And also... Like, how do you come up big when your team needs needs you the most? What is it that's inside of you that drives you? I, I I always I always wanted to be the center of attention. Hmm. I always wanted the ball. I yeah. always wanted the ball. Yeah. I didn't care if I, I didn't I didn't care if I failed. I I wanted. There's I, that. That's it. I I I was afraid. Uh, you know, failure. I was not afraid of. It was. It was. You know, I I hated losing more than I liked winning. And I wanted, I wanted, I wanted to pray. I wanted all the praise. Yeah. You know, I wanted to be, I wanted to be the guy that everybody wrote about in the papers and everybody talked about. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I didn't care if I failed. Um, I'll bounce back and you know, and do it again. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I just, I, I loved the big game. I wanted, I wanted the puck all the time. Yeah. It was, it was a funny story when I was in San Jose in my first year. We're in the playoffs in the first round. We're playing Calgary. Mike Keenan was actually the coach of Calgary at the time. I got into a into a off ice altercation with uh, with um, Ron Wilson, the coach, mm-hmm. and um, ended up getting benched for Game Six in Calgary. So you know that you know that didn't sit very well with me and all that stuff. And 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 I'll remember this forever. After the pregame skate of Game Seven. You know, Coach Wilson brings all the players to the boards to gather in to talk, you know, before we left the ice about the game. And, you know, we thought he was going to give us a big pep talk, like, boys, this is our game, so on and so forth. But he brings everybody over, and the first thing he says is, boys, we're going to win this game. There's no question about it because Jr. has more Game 7 goals than anybody in this game. He's got like, he's got like five game, game 7 goals. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, our four or five game seven goals. So we're good now. You know, Jr. is going to carry us there. Now here, I'm a I'm a third line player that just got benched and didn't yeah. play game six. And Ron Wilson is calling me out that you know that I'm the savior of game seven at a thirty at thirty nine or thirty eight years old. That's and awesome. uh, I kind of I, I kind of laughed and you know and, and shook my head and said, "I got you, boys." Yeah. Um, went out in game seven. I had two goals and two assists, and we ended up winning the hockey game. And yeah. uh, that's amazing. You know, it was, uh, yeah, it's just it's you can't be afraid of failure. You can't be afraid of 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 the of of a challenge. No, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, any any high high level athlete like yourself will say the same things. The Michael Jordans of the world and the guys who always want to be taking that last shot and they're not afraid to lose. That's a, that's a mentality that's not a lot of people have. Well, it's tough because I, I don't know. I, I, I've, I've been asked this before, and I don't know if it's a learned trait or yeah. if it's just, or if it's just, a, it's just a hereditary born, um, born trait. Yeah, if it is it born trait or a learned trait? I, I think I think players can be forced into certain things and, and become, you know, become that type of player. But I think for the most part, it's. I, I think it's. I think it's inbred in you. I think it's a personality aspect. Right. You know. Yeah, I have to agree because uh, I think it's something you're born with. I don't think it's something you can learn. Um, you you just mentioned that your last couple of years in, in San Jose were some of the funnest years you had as a player. Um, how did you know then it was time to hang them up after that second year and and you know try to it's move another on? Another great question. Another great question and one that I'll never forget. Um, so uh, during the summer, during the, during June and part of July. Um, you know, I was contemplating whether I'm going to play one more year, just finish another really good year as a, as a role model and mentor and, you know, third line, fourth line player, third line player I was really enjoying playing the game. Um, I enjoyed playing the game, but I, I found it at a certain time, at a certain time that year I got hurt. I hurt my shoulder, had some shoulder surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, I, fe- I, I, I felt getting dressed for practice was a, was a nuisance. I didn't enjoy that as much. Um, there was a lot of things that happened in that year, but I still loved being with the team, still loved playing games, still loved being, you know, in, in the lim- in limelight. So, you know, my, my friends were telling me that you got to play one more year. So, you know, some of my teammates were, you know, you got another year in you. And I'm like, yeah, you know, my wife and my kids, my kids were at a great age where they could understand the game and they know what daddy did and they love going to the games. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's another year that I could, you know, play for them and stuff like that. So, I actually went into my season ending meeting with Doug Wilson um, thinking, you know, I'm going to play one more year. I think I, I think I'm going to play one more year. Not confident about it, but you know, you know, pretty much saying, yeah, I think I want to play. Not I know I want to play. It's two yeah. two different things. Mm-hmm. And Doug Wilson looked at me and goes, "You know what, JR? I think you're done. You've just finished two great years. You've had 13 major concussions. You've just gone through a lot of injuries. Who knows whether that next injury could be the one that really, you know, that really hurts you. Yeah. And, and I'm like, and you know, he made so much sense, but at that time I needed somebody that I respected. That's right. Perfect guy to say that to you. Someone to, you know, be that mentor for me, be that leader for me to say, you know what, JR, I think you're done. You yeah. got your respect back. You got people love you. You know, you had two great years. Your career has been awesome. Yeah. You know, what else, what else do you need to do besides the Stanley Cup? And that's not guaranteed. That's right. And I remember, I remember when he said that it was like the, the entire world had lifted off my back. I can, I can remember that, that first breath after he said that was the most free breath that I've ever taken because I don't have to I don't have to go to the gym anymore to work out to get ready to play I don't have to get beat up anymore I don't have to worry about putting points up anymore I don't have to you know you know be away from the family anymore there were so many things that it was literally the easiest most relieving um, free breath that I've ever taken yeah and I knew I knew because of the way I felt there that it was that it was time that the it was right the right time. to mm-hmm. It was the right decision. It was the right time. And I will tell you this. I have not missed playing this game for one second since I retired. Wow. Not, not one. There's not one day where I said, man, I wish I'd still play this game. Well, do you know what that missed. tells me about you? That tells me that you left it all on the ice. No question. Yeah. And, I, you know, I played through everything. I played yeah. through every every injury I could possibly have. I've, you know, 
one of the best questions that was ever given to me was, you know, especially as an as an analyst and watching a game, can you name somebody who played the game all around the way that you did? Scoring goals, making you know, playmaking, assists, penalty minutes, fighting, hitting, you know, in your face hockey. Like how many how many players did it to the level that I did? Very and few. I really I, yeah, I think very few. I yeah. think, you know, it's like Brendan Shanahan. Mm-hmm. But Brendan, Sh- Brendan Shanahan didn't hit as hard as I did, as, as he, frequent yeah. as I did. No, he didn't. But he, but he fought more than I did, and, yeah. he, and he scored more goals than I did. Didn't make, he, didn't, he wasn't as a bit good of a playmaker as I was. But, you know, he, he's a guy that I think of. Um, yeah, you know, there's not many that, guys in the game today that are similar. No, I don't think even – even in my, you know, Mark, I say Mark Messier, yeah. but Mark Messier, Mark Messier didn't, didn't hit yeah. like I did, but Mark Messier was a way better scorer than I was and, um, was meaner than I was, but he didn't, he didn't fight as much as I did. He didn't hit as much as I did. Um, he was a way better leader than I was. So, but, you know, there's some things that it was, it was a good question and I really yeah. couldn't give, I really can't give an answer. No. To somebody that did it as 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 complete as I did it in every aspect of the, of the game. Yeah, no, I've I've thought about this as well. Like doing my research for this uh, for this chat, like I did. I hear somebody mention the name Jamie Ben uh, as a as a kind of a comparison to you. And you know, maybe there's moments in a game where Jamie Ben looks a little bit like Jeremy Roenick, but he certainly doesn't play the game like you do, uh, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, that uh, was that was that was another one of mine. Yeah, um, that that I that I thought of, but um, yeah, no, it doesn't doesn't even compl- doesn't doesn't even compare. Doesn't even compare. So the transition from being a pro athlete to retirement is really tough for a lot of people, and you seem to find your place in broadcasting quite quickly. You know, you're you're a natural on the air. You delivered, a, in my opinion, a very honest perspective, and your your insight, of course, uh, about what's happening on the ice was second to none. So, what was it about broadcasting? that you loved and kept you coming back year after year? Uh, I just think I, because I, I, I really enjoyed uh, watching the games. I really loved being able to teach people the, the way I saw games. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed being um, a person that was honest with my assessment and uh, told the, 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 the real truth and the real story and wasn't afraid to, um, wasn't, wasn't afraid to, um, you know, to burst people's bubbles or didn't want to make, uh, didn't, wasn't there to make friends. Uh, I thought, you know, I think people really want to hear true honesty yeah, when, I agree. when, when they get in, cause you know, too, too many times, you know, there's a alter, there's a alter, um, um, the reason for, for say networks to, you know, to want to, to be generic, um, they have a, a different, a different plan, yeah. you know, and F- NBC's plan was to make sure that they didn't r- rile the NHL feathers because they right. wanted to make sure that, you know, Oh, we have to, we have to keep our NHL contract so we can get all our money. We don't want to get, we don't want the NHL to be mad at us. Yeah. Well, that's all well and good, but that doesn't give the fan the real, you know, the real. And were they image. upfront with you about that? Like kind of, were there reins on you a little bit? Like. Oh, yeah, as, they, they, yeah. They, you know, of course they yeah. said you know you can't talk about the referees you can't talk about the teams you can't talk about the management you can't yeah. you know be careful with this especially the referees referees were odd, were untouchable right and uh, you know it it was it got to be and it, and you know what because of it it's, it was bland it's generic and exactly. people don't get people don't get excitement you know people don't get excited to to watch what okay. you're talking about because you, you're going to get the same old bullshit all the time exactly. the same generic same generic same answers yeah cliched answer yeah. that you can probably that you can probably say for every single game yeah, you can no question most of the things that are said on nbc those guys don't even have to watch the game they can say <laughs> it. yeah say it. and yeah. it'll it'll fit it'll fit the narrative yeah so for me that was that was a that was that was a bummer for me and yeah. uh you know it's just you know it's i i, I it, it got it got old for me yeah. and I was not long for for that for for that position. position anymore. So yeah, well, the whole 
I don't want to. Even I, the whole thing was even the whole thing and how it left. I think you know. Yeah. They hung me out to dry without question. Yeah. You know, my boss. My boss is a narcissist. Was a narcissist. Didn't like me. Didn't like my political views. Didn't like anything. You know, my attitude towards. Uh, you know, towards not kind of towing the line. And, you know, yeah. he was looking for a reason to get rid of me. And that's, I truly believe that. And, yeah. you know, regardless of whether I said was people, you know, yeah. some people think that or it wasn't enough for them to kind of ruin my career the way and my, my, my name the way that they did. No, absolutely not. And then, and, and as a hockey fan and as a, as a fan of you, it was absolutely garbage. And, you know, that, my, that was my question. I didn't really want to get into the details of that story because we, you know, we, we've all heard it from you before, but, did you feel deep down that they were really trying to make an example of, of you? Um, I think yes. I think that, you know, they, I think they had, they had deeper issues yeah. and they had deeper HR issues with other, other, other parts of their network and right. other people in their network. And they were having a, uh, a bigger investigation and I think they were on pins and needles. And I think, you know, I think my boss was uh, being the narcissist that he is. Um, was going to say, this is my, look, this is not happening. Look, look at what I'm doing in my division. You know, you know, look at this, look at me, look at me, look at me. And, and to make sure that everything that was going on with the, with the, with the, with the, um, with NBC's stupidity, uh, with their previous, their previous issues, um, they tried to make an example out of me and say to say, see, see what we're doing now, see what we're doing. This is what we're doing. So, right. you know, wrong place, wrong place, wrong time. Well, me and millions of others certainly enjoyed watching you as an analyst. And I've heard you talk about a little bit about your idea of no filter broadcasting. Is that still something that's going to happen? It is going to happen, and it's Sweet. going to happen very soon. Can I wish you I could explain that, please, to uh, to my listeners what that's going to look yeah, like. Yeah. So, listen again. You know, just with a lot of things that we were talking about, getting the real. The, the you know the real thoughts getting the real um the real commentary um you know i was approached by eric burns who is the colorful mlb player who's on M mlb network um played many years in the in major league baseball yeah. um to do to do a you know have you ever have you ever watched a, a a game and not like the announcers that that are doing the game and you wish you can listen to somebody else yeah and i like, often that, turn it off that, <laughs> that happens to me every single game. I can't yeah. stand to listen to people. I can't stand to listen to Pierre Maguire. And it drives oh my me absolutely gosh. crazy. You know, Glad you just said made, that. You know, there's just and and by the way, probably ninety percent of all the people um, feel the same way. Right. Um, so yeah, the, yeah. Of course, we didn't want to. Um, you know, listen. L certain certainly said. Well, what if you can you can you can call a game. You can broadcast a game. You can say whatever you want. And you can have people watch along with you and jump on a jump on a on a streaming site and ask you questions, join in the debate, uh, you know, ask you know, be uh, be give you their opinions, uh, so on and so forth. And I'm like that that would be amazing. Um, so no filter was born, mm -hmm. and it is it is it is developed into probably one of the coolest streaming sites that there is because it will be the best fan engaged sites uh, and streaming opportunities in all of all of streaming because we will from a touch of a button be allowed to accept accept our viewers to come on the show with us and be a part of the show and right. I think people People want to be a part of a show. People want to hear, want to get their opinions out there. They want to have a debate. They just don't want to. How many times do you think people sit at home listening to us at home and yell at the TV and yell at us saying, we don't know what we're talking about, or are you, are you on crack or you, you know, you suck. Yeah. This, 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 this platform is going to allow the fan their opinion and everybody to watch that debate. And, um, I think that's really cool. I think that's, and, and we're not, it's not going to be FCC regulated because we're not going to be showing the games on the network. It's going to be strictly opinionated. It's going to be, um, it's going to be original content and, you know, real, real cool shows. And, you know, obviously you got to be very still conscious of, you know, you know what you're saying and who, who you're saying it about, but, um, you know, we don't have to worry about pissing off the NHL or MLB or yeah. NFL by, you know, ripping the refs or ripping a star player or, you know, telling that, the, you know, about a trade that was terrible because the GM is terrible. Yeah. So it, it gives us it gives us that that freedom to have no filter. And I think it's a really cool idea. 
Did you? Was it all you, or did you just come up with this oh, with somebody? No, it was more. It was more Eric Burns. It was Eric okay. Burns's idea. Yeah. So, so you know, then they they teamed with some Silicon Valley guys. Yeah. And uh, you know, came um, up with it. Yeah, came up with the idea. And yeah. when it starts, I think it's going to be a big hit. But I uh, can't wait for it. I would. I'll, I will definitely be a part of that because it's something I would always be interested okay. in trying for sure. Well, you should have you should have your own show because it's like having it's a streaming podcast on steroids. On steroids. So, and by like the way, it. by the way, it's yeah. it's a lot. A lot of the platform is is created for the everyday viewer to have their own show. So yeah. you know, picture That's an eight, picture picture an eight year old. Wanting to call a show, and he's uh, he's a little character, and yeah. he calls it he calls the hockey game better than you know better than Pierre uh, the Pierre Maguire, <laughs> of course. Which, well, that was take away, much. yeah, or or more enjoyable to, to watch than Doc Emmerich, you know. Yeah. So, so yeah, cool. that reminds me of like when I was a kid and I went to the Hockey Hall of Fame for the first time, and you get to do the uh, sit up in the booth and call some famous plays. Yeah. So yeah, 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 just certainly really exciting, and something kids will definitely love yeah, to well, do. Even, even more so, these 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 people that have a have a talent that they probably wouldn't get somewhere else. They can they can start their own show, yeah, and exactly. you never know. You never know. They can use their social media to plug their show. And next thing you know, you have four or five thousand watchers of these uh, of these uh, normal everyday people that have found a niche right. on our platform. And next thing you know, you have uh, you have. Uh, sponsors and you have advertisers that want to, you know, advertise on their show because they're getting viewerships. And the next thing you know, they're putting money in their pocket because no filter shares in in the advertising dollar. Right. So you know, think of a ten or eleven year old that's just that that could be putting money in their pocket because they have a good following because the kid's got charisma and talent and conceit yeah. and can call a game. It's, it's it's a really cool opportunity. It certainly is, and I think a lot of people are gonna have a lot of fun with that. Um, as we wind things down here, Jr. Before we get to my final questions for you, I just have a couple of big, broad questions about your career. Um, first of all, I had to I have to ask. I know you're close with Gretz, so I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about him. First of all, um, playing against him, you know, being someone who you know who you looked up to, and you ended up playing for him in Phoenix, and he's your coach. Not a lot of people ask questions about Gretzky coaching, so I want to know a little bit about what he was like to to play for. And what, uh, and maybe give us an idea of like what a typical pregame speech would be from the great one. Uh, you know, he, he listen. He, it, it was. It's tough to be Wayne Gretzky in the first place. Oh no, shit. It's even, yeah. It's, it's, it's even tougher to be Wayne Gretzky to coach because he's got to live up to his playing days. He's got to live up to, um, you know, the best player in history. He's got to live up to, you know, being the person that's representing the game still as a, you know, as the best player. Uh, people are asking him to do things all the time. His time is limited to be a really good coach. You got to put a lot of time into it. Yeah. Then we're in Phoenix and he had a very mediocre team at the time. So everything was, everything was against Gretz right. of, of being a good coach in Phoenix. Um, but just like always, he had a great rapport with the players. Um, his, his ability to talk to players during practice and during the games was, and his ability to, to teach certain players was really cool. Um, I don't think he could put the time in that he wanted to, or he, that he you know, that he needed to. But um, you know, he uh, he loved being around the rink, and he yeah. loved being around the players. Um, you know, he's very he's a very soft spoken guy. Mm-hmm. You never saw him really riled. Never saw him really mad. He was always very composed. Um, and you know, he understood players. He understood what we went through. So it was, you know. Him and I didn't see eye to eye uh, at, at, at during that year because he didn't play me, you know, the way I thought I should be. Yeah. But you know, um, you know, he, I'm a huge fan of Gretz and a big fa- and a big fr- and a good friend of his. Yeah. You know, I'm proud to say that you know I am friends with him. You know, if I call him, he'll call me back, yeah. which is, you know, I like that. <laughs> yeah, so, totally. We didn't we didn't let what happened, you know, the, that year, you know, interrupt the fact that we both knew we had great careers. Yeah. You know, and we did. So what would be uh, – was he more of a X's and O's kind of guy or was he more of a motivator no, for you guys? No, he's a field player. He yeah. was a field – you know, he, he coached like he played. Yeah, okay. That's you know, what I think. You should know, you, you, you should know where, where the puck should go. You should know where you're going to be. Yeah. Know how to play the game at certain points. It was it, it was the assistant coaches that were more X's and O's. Right. Gretz just wanted, Gretz just wanted you to play with your heart and your feel, you know. Awesome. But 
but nobody can ever do it the way he did it. So <laughs> no, that tough shoes to fill there. So when you look back at your career, uh, you got a lot of milestones, of course. Uh, which one? What stands out for you the most? Is it you know playoff series it's my, goals? It's my five hundredth. Five hundredth. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I didn't think I was going to make it. You know, I was four four goals short um, yep. after my after that year with Gretz and Phoenix. And nobody was calling, you know, free agency has passed by. Nobody was calling. It wasn't until that, you know, that call in mid-August that, you know, Doug Wilson invited me to come play. And then scoring my 500th goal in November against Gretz and the Coyotes, the team that I just can't come from, you know, and actually making it, you know, would have, you know, who knows where I would have been if I ended up four goals shy and yeah. not having two years i mean i don't even want to think of where i'd be right now but uh that's probably my most proud moment. very cool all right so i reached out to my listeners um the last couple of weeks and i rounded up a few of the most common questions that they wanted me to ask you um so the first one is we all know that you love to talk and you love to chirp and um, was, was patrick why your favorite target and were there any other great chirps that you were involved in <laughs> he wasn't my favorite target but he was my favorite exchange <laughs> oh no no yeah um I don't think there'd be. I don't think there's an exchange, especially in the playoff um, playoff atmosphere, that that would beat that one between two, you know, that's, you know, that, that all, all star players. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more. That had the same kind of mentality. So that was just the that was probably just the best um, best interaction. Yeah. Um, you know, chirping. I mean, geez, I mean, I used to chirp. You know, um, Maltby and Draper in Detroit constantly I used to you know chirp with. Um, Shane Churla and and Kelly Chase in St. Louis and um, Shane Churla in Minnesota, Kelly Chase in St. Louis. I mean, every single game was a chirp session with them. So yeah, um, yeah, cool. Well, I, I certainly loved the Patrick Wall one as well. Um, yeah, a lot of people mentioned your dominance in NHL '94, the video game. At that yep. time, was it cool to talk about how good you were in a video game, like amongst the boys? <laughs> It was because I was on Swingers in '96, so it was okay. actually really cool. You All know, right. you know that's kind of like my claim to fame. That's the one thing that people talk about the most. When I know I couldn't comments. believe how many people asked yeah. me. Like the first thing it's, I'm going to interview Jr. They're like, "Oh man, he was my favorite NHL '94 player." Like it was yeah, constant. Uh, well, I was ra- you know I was rated. It was, I think I was the third best gamer of all time. Of all time, and no, it's amazing. And uh, you know, it's it's nice to have things that you can look back on that people will remember. Yeah, and that was one that they'll always remember and they'll always talk about. So, cool. you know, and Vince Vaughn, Vince, I saw Vince Vaughn in a bar afterwards, and he was a big Chicago fan. He goes, he goes, Jr. That's just I put you in there for total respect, and I love playing that game. It was the best. So that's awesome. Yeah. So Pop I know culture, you. Baby. Yeah, totally. So I know you're a big golfer. Who's the who? Do, who makes the biggest bets on the course? <sighs> Jordan. Yeah. Have you played with them? Many times. Awesome. Can you give me? I'm sure I know you're a good player, and so is he. Do you guys have competitive games? Uh, too, too many, too long. Too many, too long. Okay. <laughs> too many, too long. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's your favorite way to gamble? Golf, casino, poker? Um, I don't know. I don't think I don't. I don't think I have one. I think that they're all great. Um, probably, go, probably golf because yeah. it's it's the best way to, you know, the best way to use your talents and and grind in sticky situations and tough situations and pressure situations. So right. probably golf. Uh, right now, who's your favorite person to listen to call a game, or do you have one? Um, probably Charles Barkley. Oh, there you go. <laughs> just not call a game, but listen to people and, and you know do analysis. I don't, yep. you know, I don't really, I really don't have, you know, too many favorites. Um, you know, that's a good question. I never really even even thought about it. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll, we'll yeah. move on then. Um, Forsland's a lot of fun to listen to. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you, uh, you've written books, Jeremy, and I know you have a hell of a golf game. Um, what What are you doing right now to gear up? I hear you're gearing up for some events. Are you still going to go back to writing? Like, what are you doing right now to fill up your time? No. No. No more books for me. No more, no books? more books for me. No. No more books for me. I'm. Uh, you know, I'm going to stick to the to the streaming and a couple other things I got going and being, uh, being a good husband and being a good dad and, yep. and, uh, just getting by. Getting and by. you're, you just got back from a golf trip from Pebble beach and, uh, it looked like you had a hell of a time down there with Mr. Brian Erlacher amongst others. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. I know 
are you serious about golf right now? Because like I, I do hear rumors that you're gearing up to play nope. some events. Or are you just nope. doing that for fun? No, I just got a tournament next next month. But okay. besides that, you know, it's all it's it's all casual fun golf. But awesome. you know, yeah. Well, I hope someday okay. you can make it to Cape Breton and play the Cliffs, uh, Cabot Cliffs and Cabot Links, because I think uh, as a golfer, I, I, will, I will make it there. No you, question. Yeah, about it. I'm sure you will. All right. So finally, JR, I'm going to ask you just a quick series of one-timers, rapid-fire questions. Uh, this segment is brought to you by WheelHub Asia. WheelHub Asia is committed to building community and bringing accessibility to inline hockey players in Southeast Asia. They strive to be a catalyst for change with a collaborative approach that is focused on improving the level of inline hockey in the region through community-based initiatives. WheelHub Asia stands for professionalism, integrity, and collaboration. For inline hockey players, by inline hockey players. For all your inline hockey needs, head to wheelhubasia.com. All right, some quick rapid fire questions for you, JR. Who is the most savage prankster you ever played with? Um, that's a good question. Probably, probably Brent, Brent, and Dar- and 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 Dwayne Sutter. Okay, best overall team you have ever played on? Um, was my 1984, 85 Bantam National Championship, New Jersey Rockets. Awesome. Hardest working teammate? Chris Chris Chelios. Most talented player you ever played with? Mike Madano. On the golf course, if you had to choose one, is it vodka soda or tequila fresca? Um, Ty. <laughs> Best concert of all time? Um, for me... Probably Coldplay. Nice. Coldplay or, Nick, Coldplay or Nickelback, to tell you the truth. I'm a big nice. Nickelback fan. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, Canadian band. Can't, can't wrong you for that one. Um, nope. Your all-time dream foursome in golf. You know, I've been asked that so many times, and it always changes. Who you know, is it I, now? Jeez, uh, I couldn't. Uh, I've always thought I'd love to play with Clint Eastwood. Always thought that oh. I would love to play with Ronald Reagan because I'm a big Ronald Reagan fan. And... Um, you know, I, I think my favorite golfer um, of all time, probably pr- that I, you know, I would love to play because of his personality was Arnold Palmer. So probably I, I would go with that for some. Very cool. And finally, Jeremy, how do you want to be remembered as a player? Um, but just that as a warrior, just a warrior. Awesome. Always depend on. Him. Yep. Definitely. Well, listen, man. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming on my show. It means a lot to me. Um, you're someone who genuinely connects with his fans, and you've always done it. You've always given time to the little guy. You're a legend of the game, one of the toughest set son of a bitches to ever step on the ice. And congratulations, man, on an amazing career, and uh, I want to thank you for everything you've given to the game of hockey. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. A lot All of right. fun. Take care, JR. I wish you nothing but the best. Stay healthy. Stay safe. That was Across the Pond, and that's a wrap. Love it. Awesome. Cheers, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our amazing sponsors, the China Hockey Group, AccessoryHouseGlobal.com, Yardley Brothers Beer, Wheel Hub Asia, The Big Bite Restaurant, Sunset Studio, and Print House Limited. And a giant thank you to my producer, Andy Zombathy, who makes us sound great week in and week out. And of course, Mr. Paul McLean, who makes everything happen here at the studio. Folks, check out our website at acrossthepondhk.com. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram at acrossthepondhk.com.